playing a Paragon Shepherd, you're not going to want to wait and waste the time it would take to do that. Every second you waste is a second your crew could die, and this is proven by the game by the fact that if you take your sweet time, the, all your crew members are killed. That's an argument after the fact. The Paragon mindset is to be diplomatic, prudent, and talk things out. This is regardless of one's motivations, so the crew being abducted does not factor here. The Renegade would only care about efficiency and see it as a challenge, so you might be able to argue charging the relay with that. Whereas the Paragon would put saving lives to be a priority, the Renegade would put stopping the Collectors to be a priority. That's really as far as we can take the PR system here. So let's say you're a Renegade, you don't give a damn about your crew. Well, you still have the best chance of success by being the first one through the relay. What? How does being the first through the relay make it the best chance of success for stopping the bad guys? You mean successful in defeating the Collectors or surviving the journey through? If it's in defeating the Collectors, sure, but the problem is still the unknown nature of the relay and what causes it to be dangerous, and if we don't know what we're going to find, if we do survive, we could all just die anyway. If we manage to survive the journey, then who's to say we wouldn't encounter a small fleet ready to blow us into pieces? The biggest thing Shepard has going for him is the element of surprise. The oh, I thought it was that crack team of soldiers we spent the entire game collecting and dealing with their daddy issues. Well, I'm sure glad meeting Jacob's father helped out with our element of surprise. Where are you getting this? The second you send through a ship, probe, or anything, and they pick it up, that element of surprise is gone. The you just said the element of surprise is our biggest thing. But as soon as we send a ship, probe, or anything else, it's gone. Take it on face value, regardless of what we do. As you said, we've just exhausted our element of surprise. We were caught completely by surprise, so maybe there were enhancements made to it. But either way, it doesn't matter. The Normandy is the only one that has any sort of chance of making it through that relay stealthily. Because in comparison to using a probe or an IFF probe would be less safe and would be, what, too small and thus not stealthy in comparison to the Normandy? How about we send a few probes, wait around for 30 seconds near the Omega-4 to see if they return, then just take off, and then just try again tomorrow at some random time? How is our element of surprise broken? The point was to put together a team of specialists so that you could be the first one through the gate, use that element of surprise to your advantage, and hopefully be prepared enough to face whatever you came across. The point was to get specialists and be the first? What point is that? How to commit group suicide? Be the first through the Omega-4 relay, which could kill us immediately, and hopefully be prepared for the unknown. If we survive the voyage, what we encounter might also kill us immediately? That's retarded. This thing's called the IFF, right? What if IFF means that there's a defense grid waiting for us to get through the relay and blow us to pieces? What would getting a bunch of soldiers have anything to do with the safety of using the relay being the first through the relay and not a probe or any kind of intelligence gathering devices because our safety is only second to our element of surprise and hopefully be prepared for whatever the hell we find? A suicide mission would be where the odds and numbers are stacked against you. This is not a suicide mission. This is just suicide. Oh, oh. Shepard's tactics aren't the problem here. When we have a ranged weapon, and we're in space, and we're firing at our enemy from a safe distance, and they're getting damaged, and the only thing that causes us to crash land in the most contrived way, regardless of that weapon, then yes, we can point to Shepard and say it's his fault. We can't, however, say the same if we didn't upgrade the Phoenix Cannon, since Joker takes the initiative and charges the damn thing. So it's either Shepard or Joker's fault. Not sure what's going to happen, and you're on the edge of your seat. And the majority of the people who played the suicide mission felt that exact feeling. As opposed to role-playing games where you generally build up a character or characters and assign them combat roles like the healer or the damage dealer or the tank, and or more tactical games like Suikoden or tactical role-playing games like Ogre Battle or Final Fantasy Tactics where you create a specialized units or teams in a variety of combat scenarios. The issues I have aren't those of drama or excitement. The issue was basic logic and storytelling, and how that wasn't reflected or clarified as to why some people weren't competent in their roles, why we spent so much time on their personal quests, learning about their backgrounds, given all this backstory to show their development and skill set, when they themselves couldn't lead a team, even with the narrative telling us they could. Prime examples are when Miranda is telling us what to do, 
Zaid and Samara as leaders, Morden or Thane as tech experts, or even choosing Shepard for any role, should we not have the right people for the job? Why not bring both along? Okay, yes, but we're dividing up into two teams again, remember? Uh, so you wouldn't want to send one of the biotic bubble babes with the other team in case they happen to run into some secret drones too? Which is automatically false since one, as you said, we're dividing into two teams. The other team going to the main passage is a diversion. There are no seeker swarms there to hurt them. The bubble team is going to open doors for them at the end. That's why we're doing this. I can always put all my powerful biotics like Samara, Jack, Miranda, or Jacob in the bubble team. Or send them as an escort. And three, if the whole point was to get a door open for a safer passage of everyone else, but we're taking a more difficult route, why not just take everyone on the more difficult route? We'd have multiple biotics and multiple bubbles. We'd have a greater physical force to kill enemies faster, and no one would have gotten separated or tired. We're moving at a walking pace. If someone got tired from maintaining the bubble, someone else could have taken over. Just because Jacob has this as a loyalty power doesn't mean no one else is capable of doing it. It also doesn't mean that Jacob's the best at doing it, but hey, let's say that he's really good at making a barrier around himself. Well, point number two is that there's a big difference between covering yourself in a barrier and covering an entire group in a barrier. It's a difference of power, which Jacob does not have. How do you know this? We don't know what a powerful biotic maintaining a large bubble entails. Because if it's being physically fit, Jacob's got that in the bag. This could be a cakewalk for him, for all we know. This is really the same issue for other reasonings on the suicide mission, where the narrative or gameplay lore says one thing, but ends up not being relevant just because. Having a larger skill in something implies using less time and energy, and thus being more efficient in conducting that activity. If there's ever a reason for having a character's loyalty power be plot integral to a scene, as well as a mental state being based off the theme of loyalty, this was the perfect opportunity for Jacob to have that. His heavy barrier ability has a duration of 60 seconds. His improved barrier has 180 seconds. Three times the duration? What, is he storing element zero in his abs? That sounds pretty significant. We're just looking at gameplay lore. When we look at anyone except a loyal Samara or Jack, who do maintain the bubble, they all do pretty much the same job until the last 5-10% of the journey. In terms of those two being super powerful biotics, that's really nothing special. So it doesn't matter if he makes the most fantastic barrier in the world if it only stays up for 30 seconds. Whereas we know loyalty is important for the suicide mission in some magical unknown way, I can actually explain Jacob's loyalty power and how it could have related to this scene. I still can't explain how Samara's Reeve, or Jack's warp ammo power, even works within the Mass Effect lore. If you're really efficient at making barriers, and that's what you've been doing since you've achieved your loyalty-created mental state, then you simply wouldn't need to be as strong a biotic. The issue with the roles is still unclarity. We don't know how loyalty works, and the logic and effects of choosing even loyal squad mates for roles is almost pure guesswork. One, shape and size, and why? Why is this thing in the shape of a human with three eyes? Okay, so it has three eyes. Big whoop. So Three eyes is a cosmetic, though still valid question. My real point was shape, size, and why. Why is it in the shape of a human? Why is it huge? And what is it going to do? Why do Reapers need a big-ass skeleton? Why is it taking liberties in physical structures for some but not others? And on and on. Is it huge? What possible use would a giant human-shaped cybernetic triclops be? They weren't making it into the shape of a human because they thought it'd be fun to look at. They didn't actually have a plan with it. it huh? It's not like they really have a choice. If they want to... If they don't have a choice on what species to melt, why would they have a choice on the number of appendages or organs, shape, or size, like the eyeballs? I don't understand. Why were they even building this ridiculous thing? Aren't Reapers supposed to be giant, non-organic ships? Incorrect. Reapers are sapient constructs, a hybrid of organic and inorganic material. And how does Edie know Reapers are a hybrid of organic and inorganic material if she's never encountered any others? Oh wait, she did. She was created from Sovereign. Wouldn't she have known before Reapers were cybernetic from there? 
Oh, wait, she also encountered the derelict Reaper. Wouldn't she also have figured it out by then? But now, all Reapers are organic? Really? If they can build themselves any way they want, who's to say they even need organics? Maybe Harbinger is some crazy experimental baby maker. The exact construction methods are unclear. Oh, the exact construction methods are unclear. Hmm, I guess Edie isn't clear on how Reapers are made or if this human reaper is the only cybernetic one of its kind. But it seems probable that the reapers absorb the essence of a species, utilizing it in their reproduction process. So it's probable a reaper absorbs the essence of a species. Okay, what the hell is the essence of a species? I don't think genetics can answer philosophical questions like that. And I'm quite sure this extremely sophisticated narrative isn't playing around with a theme like that. You see, it's not that I didn't pay attention is that this is one giant retcon that doesn't make a lick of sense when you do pay attention, partly because it's based on speculation. If Reapers are so powerful, as we were told, and they need organisms to procreate, cloning any organism they desire to base around a new Reaper should be a walk in the park, especially if they can repurpose protheans into a giant bug species to be their slaves, implant them with technology, and control their bodies and minds. Needing humans or whatever just to procreate after potentially hundreds of millions or billions of years sounds absolutely ridiculous to even supposed cybernetic gods. I'm sorry, could you point to where in the game that it says that they are simply melting down the human body and then throwing that whole pile of goop into the reaper? Okay. The colonists were processed. Those swarms of little robots, they melted their bodies into gray liquid and pumped it through these tubes. Chakwas said processed. Melting something down into a gray liquid is a form of processing. What's not to understand here? If you look at the stuff being pumped into the Reaper, it's glowing orange. Hmm, you're right. I thought it would be gray. Hmm, even more retcons. So what, they melted some glow sticks too? Added phospholuminescence? Those canisters has internal light sources? Maybe it's some entertaining, colorful, happy patterns to play peekaboo with the baby. How many piles of human goop do you know that glow orange? I plead the fifth. It means that they changed it in some shape or form to be fitted to the Reaper. I don't understand how you think that they're just throwing some huge blood protein shake into a Reaper. Because we're humans. We're big, watery sacks of blood, protein, bone, and tissue. Again, if we're just being broken down into liquid components, what's the point? My example of a muscle tissue made sense. You did not address that. Chakwas describes gray goo. You're saying this glowing orange goo is special. So what does all this stuff even do? What extra compound is involved in adding it to a reaper to make it glow? What's the point? Humans. Well, okay, well first of all, what kind of weird logic are you using to think it's going to take decades to complete this thing? Math. Uh, she said it's going to take millions more. Now, not tens of millions, so let's ref roughly estimate, say, nine million people all abducted. The number of people on Horizon was over 600,000. Of course, they only got about half of them, but let's pretend that they had plans to get all of them. So let's say that the average colony they hit has maybe 500,000 people. Putting it low. Well, don't you seem to like the codex. Let's see. This is what I've found. See, I can cherry-pick entries from the Codex just as well. For the really low entries, it would take the collector's efforts a really long time. For the really high entries, well, they're just one ship. They'd get destroyed. Therefore, they'd have to pick only really low colony sizes. But in any case, by the time that you're into the, the finale of the game, you're talking nine months, if that. Maybe a year, if you want to stretch it out. Hell, I'll even give you two years. Two years till completion. But decades? Come on! And now it's your turn to pay attention. Remember what Edie said? It appears the collectors have processed tens of thousands of humans. Significantly more will be required to complete the Reaper. It doesn't matter how many they've collected. Making this thing takes time. This could mean several things. It takes a long while to process humans, and some humans weren't processed yet. If it takes a lot of humans to process, it could mean a lot of material gets lost in that process, and by Ed's observation, which I'm guessing would be based on volume, might not account for everything. Or both. 
Let's keep in mind hundreds of thousands of humans have already gone missing, before Shepard even goes to Freedom's Progress, and it's been two years. When we meet this thing, they've collected hundreds of thousands more. So not only is collecting humans time-consuming, but so is processing them. And if through processing them volume is lost, then we're going to need a hell of a lot more humans and a hell of a lot more time to build the thing. Now we know they're not all processed, but I'm feeling generous, so we will imagine that no volume is lost. Let's speed up the process as well, and we'll hit the upper limit, and if Edie says tens of thousands, let's say they have processed 90,000 people, and do so every two years. Let's be generous again, since Edie says it'll take millions, so we'll assume the lowest amount, which is 2 million. So 2 million divided by 90,000 is 22 iterations. 90,000 times 22 is 1,980,000, but we already have 90,000 processed, so we end up with 2,070,000. 22 iterations times 2 years, that's 44 years. Thus, it'll take roughly 44 years, or 42 years from now, to finish this thing, if Edie's analysis was even correct. And that's just to make the body of the human goop. We don't know how long it'll take to make the Reaper ship, or any other mechanical or technological components this thing is going to be composed of or ride in. Lucky for us, the logic behind this plan makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Whatever you say, boss. First of all, there's no evidence stating that they would even have to go into Alliance space. We don't know how many humans live in the Terminus system, and we don't know how many more humans they still need to finish this project. Millions. The issue isn't just where they'll get them, but how, how safely, and after all this time, some force might do something about it, but also the time to completion. Collecting them is just the first step. Then you go on to say that they would need to build some sort of ship for the little baby that they're making now? Why? It's a Reaper! It will just fly through space on its own, like all the other Reapers do! Those ships that you seem to be talking about are Reapers! What they're building is a Reaper, which means that it will be able to float through space on its own. And while we may think that it's a little silly for something human-shaped to float through space, I doubt the Reapers really care what we think is silly. Well, this was just one long rant with not understanding my first point and the evidence in the narrative. That was shape, size, and why. For example, just looking at the human Reaper and looking at Sovereign, there is an obvious difference in scale. Reapers are dreadnoughts. Even if the human reaper had its legs, that'd be what, 300, maybe 500 meters tall? Sovereign was massive. It was two kilometers tall. Now, unless they change their designs, that's going to take a long, long time to construct. Now, if you want to get it to that scale, that is to say a human giant reaching two kilometers, to look like a giant human, well, how is that going to be constructed? Is that going to be like a Matroshka doll, where it's one bigger version of itself built upon and over itself over the years? This comes back to the shape argument. Reapers are based off the organism that's being melted down to make them. Okay, so why aren't there any different looking Reapers? Why aren't there bipedal types with one head and two arms or anything different? Or any humanoid looking Reapers? Look at them all. They're all cuttlefish. Not one has two arms and two legs or they just all look like giant seafaring things. It's pretty obvious. They're going to put this thing into something for protection, like for it to ride around in, which implies more time and resources. Why? Because Reapers are giant ships. Unless this thing is something totally different and new and never been done before. And if you think about it, that's probably a lot more useful than a ship that looks like a squid. How would a giant two-kilometer human be more useful than a giant squid? More useful in to do what? Play football? What the hell are you talking about?